I don't want to go on too long here, but I'll, I'll bring up one first round pick, Nikhil Harry, that we're dealing with here in New England. This is a guy who was born in Turks and Caicos. When he was in high school, he was sent to live with his uh, grandmother in Chandler, Arizona, because I understood he was a phenomenal basketball player, primarily. Started playing football as well. Had some concussions in high school. Thought about quitting football. Goes to Arizona State. Plays football there. Winds up a first-round pick. Comes to New England, the most intense, demanding program in the NFL. He just wasn't really built for that level of intensity over the course of his life from the age of seven and Pop Warner until he got here. And I think it's borne out over the course of time while he's been here. This was the worst place he could have gone. Michael, back to you. I want to back up to the Jets for a second, because as you were explaining what the Jets are trying to do, it reminded me of the fact that the Jets continue to try to build their team from the outside in instead of the inside out. You're never going to have a good team in New York unless you have a great offensive line and a competent defensive line. But they've been so caught up in bells and whistles in recent years, they're getting it backward. They need to focus on offensive line to protect Zach Wilson before they think about going out and buying or trading for a big-name receiver. Because it doesn't matter who it is if he's not open. And if it's Debo Samuel, we're going to talk about that in a second, doesn't matter if you're going to hand him the football if, if he can't get blocking to spring him open and give him an opportunity to get to the second level and beyond. But as it relates to Nikhil Harry, you raise a, a, a point that I've been struggling with as it relates to the chronic inability of Bill Belichick's Patriots to mm -hmm. draft and develop young receivers. Because I think it's a combination of bad scouting, bad selection, and bad development. Because I can envision Bill Belichick out on the practice field. They're running the reps. They've got the young receivers. They don't know where to line up. They don't know what they're supposed to do. He gets pissed off and he says, get me somebody out here who knows what they're doing. And they just never develop the way they could. It can't be that all these guys are just whiffed on in the scouting process. I think when they get there, whether it's because they're overwhelmed well, it's because the offense is too complicated. Maybe everybody would fail. I say all the time, hey, they picked Nikhil Harry. They could have had Debo Samuel, A.J. Brown, D.K. Metcalf. They, they passed on each of them and took Nikhil Harry. But maybe the other three guys would have failed too. Very I, fair I just argument. don't know whether it's just bad scouting or bad development. But as you explain the history and the background of Nikhil Harry, I say, why did they think he was going to be fish to water with the Patriot way? I think there was a link to the ASU as Arizona state um, head coach, Todd Graham at the time. And Belichick felt comfortable with his appraisal of Harry Belichick has often said, look, when I ask people for advice, I want to ask people who know what my standards are. So that when I say, so that when he says he's a good football player, we both know what I'm talking about in the keel Harry's instance, he is a player who, who looks the part, fits the suit, doesn't play with the style all the time that you'd want. So I don't know why they missed on it, but I don't know if A.J. Brown from Ole Miss was the kind of player that they would want either at that juncture. I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen them take a player from Ole Miss. Belichick has these profiles of players and colleges that he'll go to. Right now it's Georgia and Michigan, um, largely, um, and Alabama, obviously. But Alabama had fallen off for a while. Rutgers. So, what happened to Rutgers? Yeah, Rutgers for that Rutgers. period of time. And there's yeah. times where I look at that and, and say, you're not really casting this huge wide net. You're going back over and over and over again to the same places, which in one hand is good, but there's also some good players out there, talented players. I will say there's an interesting aspect of the development. Some of it ties back to Tom Brady, where his demand level for players – made it difficult for them to not pee their pants on their way to practice and poop them during practice because he would Thank scream you. at them when they messed it up. You. But you take a guy like Jacoby Myers, undrafted out of North Carolina State, I'm not saying that he's a, a Pro Bowl level receiver. He's been extremely productive here. He's developed. Edelman developed. A kid named Malcolm Mitchell, fourth round pick, developed. All of them, two undrafted, no, excuse me, one undrafted, one seventh and a fourth. Those are their best developed receivers. So it's the scouting, bottom line. It's, it's the scouting um, or the decision made because sometimes the scouting points the team in one direction and the decision made by Bill on draft day is different. 
Two important points. One, you better give Bill Belichick good information when he comes calling or he's never going to listen to you ever again. I I think Todd Graham is off the list now. And that reminds me of something that Jim Mora, the younger, told me four or five years ago. When he is asked for those assessments about players, he always tells the truth because the most important thing is his credibility. He doesn't get get caught up in, I got to help my guy. It's more... Mm -hmm. I need to have credibility with these folks. So when there is a truly great player and I tell them that, that player gets showcased, selected, scouted, and has an opportunity to thrive. And the other thing you said, and this is a critical point, because this this proves something I've said in the past as it relates to quarterbacks. But even receivers now, if it had been A.J. Brown to the Patriots and Nikhil Harry to the Titans, is it possible that... Right now, A.J. Brown would be the guy on the way out after the arrival of Devontae Parker via trade, and we'd be talking about Nikhil Harry getting a gigantic contract with the Tennessee Titans. Is it that simple? You just flip where they played, flip where they developed, flip where they came of age and the opportunities they had? I mean, there really aren't many opportunities in the grand scheme of things to prove what you can do. You got 16 games a year, now 17. You've got a total of 49 games over the last three years for both of these guys to prove themselves and it it just shows you how many other factors beyond the inherent talent work ethic ability and will of the player that goes into it and when a player fails it doesn't mean the player failed the circumstances failed and there are a lot of factors that can go into it and that same player could have thrived somewhere else could have in this instance i don't think Nikhil harry is wired for the intensity level of the nfl at this point but there were a million times mike over the last few years where i look at him i go he's 22 he's the same age as my middle son and when you get to an age in life um for the viewers out there who are dealing with it when we're covering these teams and especially a kid who comes from a college into the league and you have a kid at that age you start to view it (laughs) Uh, not always, but a little bit differently. So I've sometimes made the effort to pull a punch with evaluating Nikhil, but I think it's been hardwired instinctive for him, instinctive in the right way. Hardwired, he was not programmed as someone who lived in, say, Texas, Florida, Georgia, to love football from the beginning of his career. And then he went to a place where football has to course through your veins. I think A.J. Brown would have been able to play here in New England. Same with D.K. Metcalf, the other guys who fit that suit. I'm just stunned that Bill Belichick would miss so badly then on a guy where the warning signs were there that he's not going to be baked in football, 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 the way that you need in order to thrive with the New England Patriots. It really is amazing. And I get what you're saying, too. My son's now 25. As you have children that progress through the early 20s and you deal with those children and the issues that they deal with, the issues their friends deal with, you develop a much greater sensitivity to what these kids are dealing with and you throw in the money, the social media, the notoriety and everything that goes along with it. And we expect them because they are such phenomenal physical specimens, we expect them I don't know. I don't say we, and I definitely don't now that I understand the mentality of someone in his early 20s much better than when I was in my early 20s. We can't expect them to be as mature as that ability, that football ability would suggest. They are still Mm -hmm. unfinished products. The brain doesn't complete its overall growth and development until 25. And there's a lot of factors that go into it. And I just think that so much of that gets lost on coaches and and general managers and owners because in their mind these are just new pieces for our football factory and we're going to jam them into place and they're either going to mm-hmm. work or they're not and if they don't we're going to throw them out and we're going to put a new piece in and it's that cold it's that dispassionate it's that objective because they they have no other way that they can justify doing it that's the way they've always done it Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.